Good morning, and welcome to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's public field hearing in Nashville, Tennessee. At today's field hearing, you will hear Director Richard Cordray and a panel of distinguished experts discuss payday lending issues. My name is Cheryl Parker Rose, and I am the Assistant Director for the Office of Intergovernmental Affairs at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, or the CFPB. The CFPB's mission is to help consumer finance markets work by making rules more effective, by consistently and fairly enforcing those rules, and by empowering consumers to take more control over their economic lives. Our audience today includes elected officials, community leaders, advocates, industry representatives, and of course, consumers. We are pleased to welcome State Representative Brenda Gilmore and staff from the offices of Congressman Jim Cooper. We are also honored to be joined by Attorney General Bob Cooper, whom you will be hearing from shortly. I'll spend a few moments telling you about what you can expect at today's event before we get started. First, you will hear welcoming remarks from Attorney General Cooper. After his remarks, the CFPB's director, Richard Cordray, will provide comments about payday lending issues. David Silberman, CFPB's Associate Director for Research, Markets, and Regulations, will then lead a panel discussion to discuss payday lending. Following the panel discussion, there will be an opportunity to hear from audience participants. The audience participation portion of the public meeting provides audience members with the opportunity to share their response to today's discussion and to share consumer fin finance practices and trends in their communities. The audience participation portion will be moderated by Zixta Martinez, CFPB's Associate Director for External Affairs. Today's public meeting is being live streamed at consumerfinance.gov. You can also follow CFPB on Twitter and Facebook, hashtag PaydayLoans. So let's get started. I'd like to begin by introducing Tennessee's Attorney General, Robert E. Cooper, Jr., who was sworn in as Attorney General for the state of Tennessee on November 1, 2006. He was appointed by the Supreme Court to serve an eight-year term. The Attorney General's office has achieved many notable accomplishments during General Cooper's tenure, including obtaining a default judgment of almost $11 million against a nationwide group that targeted Fort Campbell soldiers with predatory sales and lending practices, taking action against a national electronics product company, alleging the company targeted at least 4,500 primarily low-income Tennessee consumers with high-pressure sales tactics and failure to disclose key contract terms and also the creation of a foreclosures working group comprised of state agencies that file suit against foreclosure and file suit against foreclosure rescue operations in Memphis. Attorney General Cooper, the floor is yours. Cheryl, thank you for that introduction, and thank you also for this opportunity uh, to welcome Director Richard Cordray and his team from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau uh, to Tennessee, uh, as well as this uh, great crowd uh, and the distinguished panelists we're going to hear from today. Now, I have trouble calling Rich Cordray director because I know him as general. I had the privilege of serving with Rich when he was Attorney General of the great state of Ohio. And I will tell you that he was a real leader in our National Association of Attorneys General. Now, in our association, you learn a lot about your colleagues. And one thing I learned about Rich, in addition to all the great things he was doing in Ohio, was that in 1987, he was the undefeated five-time champion on Jeopardy and won $43,000. So, when he first ran for public office, his bumper stickers said, appropriately, the answer is Richard Cordry. <laughs> now, as far as the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is concerned, the answer is still Richard Cordry. The president could not have found a better director to get the bureau off the ground. Rich's former AG colleagues were delighted at his appointment. 
because we all share the same challenging, challenging mission, to make the market for financial products and services work for consumers, whether they're applying for a mortgage, choosing among credit cards, considering an education loan, or using any number of other consumer financial products. This means ensuring that consumers get the information that they need to make the best financial decisions for themselves and for their families, that prices are clear up front, that risks are visible, and that nothing is buried in the fine print. Now, in markets that work, consumers should be able to make direct comparisons among financial products, and no provider should get away with unfair, deceptive, or abusive practices. This is critical work, and Rich and his team at the Bureau are doing a great job at it. Now, let me mention one important effort by the Bureau that we are also pursuing here in Tennessee. Last year, the Bureau released policy recommendations that advocate greater financial education for our youth. Here in Tennessee, we have been leading the way in that area. In 2006, Tennessee passed a law requiring high school students to take a personal finance course before they could graduate. The course is, help, is designed to help students understand the real world impact of their financial decisions. The topics covered include income, money management, spending and credit, and saving and investing. As part of the law, teachers are required to attend training classes in personal finance. And my office participates in that training uh, by giving presentations on consumer protection laws as part of the Tennessee Jumpstart Coalition, which is a non-for-profit group that promotes financial literacy among our youth. Now, don't, don't uh, misunderstand me, my office and the Bureau work hard to help the victims of predatory business, but there is no substitute for a savvy consumer who knows exactly what questions to ask and therefore never becomes a victim. So it's important to start young and to educate consumers before they get that first credit card or first loan. Now, Rich and the CFPB staff also realize that some government regulations, uh, shall we say, can be difficult to understand. Therefore, the Bureau is committed to making its own regulations and guidance as clear and streamlined as possible so that providers of consumer financial products know exactly what is expected and can structure their practices accordingly. Now, this meeting today in Nashville is part of the Bureau's mission to get the word out about the Bureau's work and to hear from consumers and industry about the challenges that they face in today's financial marketplace. Now, before closing, I'd like to point out that this is not the first visit by the Bureau to Tennessee. We've been fortunate to have Assistant Director and Head of Service Member Affairs, Holly Petraeus, here several times. She has been to Fort Campbell in Clarksville uh, and met with the State Attorneys General for Tennessee and Kentucky there. Uh, and we also accompanied her to the 164th Wing Command and the Millington Naval Support Base uh, in Memphis. And this has been part of her tour of military installations across the nation to learn more about consumer issues as they impact our service members. And just a year ago, Ms. Petraeus came to Nashville for a forum on protecting service members and their families, a forum that included attorneys general from all over the South. We appreciate her help in our efforts to protect our service men and women and their families from consumer fraud. Now, there are many people, as you heard, who are here today uh, who have important things to say on this subject, so I'm not going to take any more time except to reiterate my thanks to Rich and to the Bureau for being here and to let everyone attending today's uh, proceedings to know how important it is that they are willing to share their experiences about what is working and what is not working in the financial marketplace and how it can be improved. So thank you again for being here. Thank you, General Cooper. I'm now pleased to introduce Richard Cordray. Prior to his current role as the CFPB's first director, he led the CFPB's enforcement office. Before that, he served on the front lines of consumer protection as Ohio's attorney general. In this role, he recovered more than $2 billion for Ohio's retirees, 
investors, and business owners. And he took major steps to help protect its consumers from fraudulent foreclosures and financial predators. Before serving as Attorney General, he also served as an Ohio State Representative, Ohio Treasurer, and Franklin County Treasurer. Director Cordray. Thank you, Cheryl. And my thanks to Attorney General Cooper, uh, who I was privileged to serve alongside when I was the Attorney General in Ohio. I've come to think of Ohio and Tennessee, General, as neighboring states. I know that Kentucky is actually in between, but I uh, understand that historically, Tennessee was the 16th state in the Union in 1796, and Ohio was the 17th in 1803. So I was always pleased and, and uh, not at all bashful about borrowing uh, from Bob things that he had been doing in Tennessee and bringing them to Ohio. I also have found that Columbus and Nashville seem to have a lot in common. I know that, although I'm not a hockey uh, expert myself, that the Predators and the Blue Jackets now duke it out on the ice uh, regularly. Uh, and uh, there's much in common between these two state capitals. Uh, and we're just very, very pleased to be with you here uh, today. And we thank Nashville for a, for a warm welcome in this splendid uh, venue here, uh, uh, tribute to uh, the country music uh, phenomenon. Uh, that is very popular in my home state of Ohio and, and throughout the country. Today we're releasing a research study on payday loans. We chose this part of the country to release this study because of the prevalence of payday lenders both here and in many of the neighboring states, including, in my view, uh, Ohio. Congress has charged the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau with the dual responsibility for assuring that consumers have access to financial services and making sure that the market for those services is are fair, transparent, and competitive. In particular, we envision a marketplace where both consumers and honest businesses can benefit from reliable small credit lending. Payday loans were developed to provide small loans to consumers to meet a short-term need. Consumers who take out these loans are usually required to repay them from their next paycheck. Payday lending as we know it originated in the late 1980s and 1990s when a number of state legislatures were persuaded to create a special exemption to their state usury laws that established a new framework for small dollar lending. Under the protective umbrella of that new exemption, payday lending has spread and grown rapidly over the past two decades. Today, payday loans are readily available online and in many states through storefronts as well. According to reports from industry analysts, over 12 million American adults are currently choosing to borrow money through payday loans. For consumers in a pinch, getting the cash they need can seem worth it at any cost. Many consumers would never dream of paying an annual percentage rate of 400% on a credit card or any other type of loan, but they might do it for a payday loan where it feels like they can get in and get out very quickly. People often are responding to circumstances they view as presenting an emergency that requires immediate access to money. In fact, the core payday loan product was designed and justified as being expressly intended for short-term emergency use. But our study today again confirms that payday loans are leading many consumers into longer-term expensive debt burdens. Our research confirms that too many borrowers get caught up in the debt traps these products can become. The stress of having to reborrow the same dollars after already paying substantial fees is a heavy yoke that impairs a consumer's financial freedom. Today's report is based on data drawn from a 12-month period that represents more than 12 million storefront payday loans. It is a continuation of the work we did last year in our report on payday loans and deposit advance products, which was one of the most comprehensive studies ever undertaken on this market. In last year's report, we studied the number of loans that borrowers take out over the course of a year and the length of time that borrowers are in debt over the course of the year. We found that too often payday consumers are getting caught in a revolving door of debt. Today's study builds on our prior research and digs deeper into payday loans with even more analysis behind the numbers. We look at new payday loans and examine how often borrowers roll over the loans or take out another loan within 14 days of paying off the old loans. We did this because we consider these subsequent loans really to be renewals that are part of the same loan sequence. What we mean is that the subsequent loans are prompted by a single need for money. That is, the follow-on loans are taken out to pay off the same initial debt for the consumer. Maybe that consumer took out the loan to pay for a car repair. Or maybe she took it out to pay for an unexpected trip to the hospital. 
or maybe she was just short some of the money needed to get by at the end of the month. Whatever the reason, the loan sequence comprises all of the renewal loans that the consumer took out to pay for the costs incurred from or made unaffordable by that initial need. Our study today is the most in-depth analysis to date of this pattern. Another way of stating the matter is that our central concern here is not with every payday loan made to a consumer. Preserving access to small dollar loans means, after all, that some such loans should be available. Our concern instead is that all too often those loans lead to a perpetuating sequence. That is where the consumer ends up being hurt rather than helped by this extremely high cost loan product. And it is well known that payday loans often lead to this damaging result. Our report today further documents this concern in much greater detail. Our research found that for about half of all initial payday loans, those that are not taken out within 14 days of a prior loan, borrowers are able to repay the loan with no more than one renewal. However, we also found that more than one in five initial loans that are made result in loan sequences involving seven or more loans. With a typical fee of 15% for each payday loan, consumers who renew their loans seven times or more will have paid more in fees alone than the amount they originally borrowed. For these people, the piling up of fees eclipses the actual payday loan itself. Moreover, when we looked at the 14-day windows in the states that apply cooling off periods to reduce the level of same-day renewals, the renewal rates are nearly identical to states without these limitations. This renewing of loans can put consumers on a slippery slope towards a debt trap in which they cannot get ahead of the money they owe. And that tells us that even if state law precludes consumers from taking out another payday loan immediately on the spot, the pressure of their circumstances, now intensified by the heavy expense of the payday loan itself, tends to force consumers to find their way back to the payday lender about as soon as the law permits. As for the amounts that people are borrowing, we found that in four out of five loan sequences in which borrowers renew the loan, they end up borrowing the same amount or more, sometimes again and again. So because they rolled over their loans, they end up owing as much or more on their very last loan as the entire amount they had borrowed initially. Tragically, these consumers find that they're simply unable to make any progress in reducing the debt over time. Most telling, the study found that four out of five payday loans are rolled over or renewed within two weeks, and that roughly half of all loans are made to borrowers in loan sequences lasting 10 or more loans in a row. From this finding, one could readily conclude that the business model of the payday industry depends on people becoming stuck in these loans for the long term since almost half their business comes from people who are basically paying high cost rent on the amount of their original loan. These are not just abstract numbers. They reflect the circumstances of people across the United States who are running into trouble with payday loans. Several thousand have submitted complaints to the Consumer Bureau because they've gotten caught in these spider webs of debt. Since we started taking payday loan complaints in November of 2013, just four months ago, we've already heard from thousands of consumers across the country. Some consumers have told us about circumstances in which a payday loan proved beneficial to them, but others have told us a very different story. Take Lisa from Pennsylvania, who submitted a complaint to us after taking out a payday loan. Lisa told us she lost her job at a local hospital and went to a payday lender to help pay her rent. She meant to take out the loan for a short amount of time. She thought she would be able to get in and get out of the loan very quickly but she ended up rolling it over. She also took out a second loan to pay for the first loan. In total, she says, she took out $800. Today, despite having paid back more than $1,400, she still has not entirely paid off the loans. Now she's trying to turn her life around. She tells us she's taking classes, holding down two jobs, and moving in with her parents to save money. Yet the struggle continues. Quote, it caught me totally off guard, she said. I got stuck in a cycle. Her information eventually got sold to a debt collector, and now she tells us she's getting called five times a day. Lisa's story is all too common. She thought she could get in and out of the loan, but ended up spiraling downward in debt. She slipped on the steep slope and just kept on sliding. Our study also looked at payday borrowers who were paid on a monthly basis. It found that many payday borrowers fall into this category, such as elderly Americans on disability, or, di or disability recipients on fixed incomes. A fair number of them remained in debt for the entire year of our study, the entire year, 
living for all practical purposes with a high cost lien against their everyday life. Indeed, of the payday borrowers who were receiving monthly payments, one out of five borrowed money in every single month of the year. These borrowers, which includes those who receive supplemental security income and social security disability or retirement benefits, are thus in serious danger of ensnaring themselves in a debt trap when they take out a payday loan. This fact is of great concern to us. Evelyn, an 81-year-old woman from Texas, had to deal with this very situation. Evelyn told us she had never taken out a payday loan in her life until she needed to pay for her dying daughter's cancer medicine. She saw an ad on TV and on a Saturday morning went down to her local payday storefront to take out $380. She was hoping her daughter would get well and pay back the money herself. But the cancer took away her daughter just a few months later. Evelyn, on a fixed income that combined her widow's pension and social security checks, tried to pay back the loan bit by bit. But every time she hit her due date at the beginning of the month, she had to renew the loan because she did not have the full amount plus the new fees. As the many months passed, Evelyn's outstanding balance grew to be more than $700. These kinds of stories are heartbreaking, and they're happening all across the country, even in states that have adopted mandatory cooling off periods and other regulations. They demand that we pay serious attention to the human consequences of the payday loan market. In January 2012, we added payday lenders to our program of supervising financial institutions. It was, in fact, one of the first things we did after I took over as the director of the Consumer Bureau. Almost immediately, we decided to hold a field hearing in Birmingham, Alabama, so that we could hear directly from stakeholders about the costs and benefits of actual consumer experience with this kind of small dollar loan. And we began to undertake our first closer study of these issues, which led to last year's report. Through our supervisory work, we've become concerned about situations we've found where payday lenders have inhibited borrowers from using company payment plans that are intended to assist them when they have trouble repaying their outstanding loans. Moreover, we found that some lenders use the electronic payment system in ways that pose risks to consumers. These practices can hinder consumers from getting out of debt or can leave them entirely unable to prioritize the payment of their various debts in ways that would leave them better off. Our examinations also show that a troubling number of these companies engage in collection activities that may be unfair or deceptive in one or more ways. These activities that we have found include using false threats, disclosing debts to third parties, making repeated phone calls, and continue to call borrowers after being requested to stop. The same is true for debt collectors that work for payday lenders and that may fail to honor the protections that are afforded to consumers through the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. As we uncover these problems, we're taking actions that require firms to comply with the law by changing their practices and to make consumers whole for any harm they've suffered as a result of legal violations. The fundamental problem is that too many borrowers cannot afford the debt that they've taken on or at least cannot afford the size of the payments required by a payday loan. In the end, consumers are at risk of using these products in ways that go beyond their intended purpose. This concerns us at the Consumer Bureau, and it should concern anyone who's focused on the payday market, because financial products that trigger a cycle of debt are likely to disrupt the precarious balance of consumers' financial lives, leaving them worse off. We've also taken further steps to protect consumers in this space. In an enforcement action against Cash America International, we ordered one of the largest short-term small dollar lenders in the country to refund consumers for robo-signing court documents in debt collection lawsuits. We ordered Cash America to pay up to $14 million in refunds to consumers and levied an additional $5 million fine both for these violations and for obstructing our examination team by destroying records in advance of our arrival. We also sued a company named Cash Call, along with its owner, its subsidiary, and its affiliate, for collecting money that consumers did not even owe. We believe that defendants engaged in unfair, deceptive, and abusive practices in violation of the federal consumer financial laws, including illegally debiting consumer checking accounts for loans that were void. The Bureau's investigation showed that these high-cost loans violated either licensing requirements or interest rate caps, or both in at least eight states, and perhaps more, which had the legal effect of either voiding or nullifying the loans. Last fall, we released new guidelines to our examiners who are supervising payday lenders on how to identify consumer harm and risks related to Military Lending Act violations. And for the past year, we've been working directly with the Department of Defense and other agencies to revise the regulations implementing the Military Lending Act. 
with the goal of fulfilling the congressional objective of ensuring more consistent protection of our service members in the consumer financial marketplace. In sum, we're taking a variety of actions in this space that address serious harms to consumers. And as we learn more about this industry, we will remain vigilant to address other concerns as they are identified. The purpose of all this additional outreach, research, and analysis on these issues is to help us figure out the right approach to protect consumers in the marketplace for payday loans. We want to ensure they will have access to a small loan market that is fair, transparent, and competitive. As we look ahead to our next steps, I will frankly say that we are now in the late stages of our considerations about how we can formulate new rules to bring needed reforms to this market. We continue to grapple with all aspects of these issues. We have always acknowledged that the American consumer has shown a clear and steady demand for small dollar credit products, which can be helpful for the consumers who use them on an occasional basis and can manage to repay them without becoming mired in a pro prolonged and costly struggle. So we intend to make sure that consumers who can afford to take out small dollar loans can get the credit they need without jeopardizing or undermining their financial futures. But we also need to recognize, and today's study underscores this fact, that loan products which routinely lead consumers into debt traps should have no place in their lives. Thank you. Thank you, Director Cordray. At this time, I'd like to invite our panelists to take the stage. While they're doing so, I will also take a minute to introduce two of my CFPB colleagues, Corey Stone and David Silverman. Corey Stone is the Bureau's Assistant Director for the Office of Deposits, Cash Collections, and Reporting Markets. He came to the Bureau after a career of consulting and entrepreneurship in the financial services industry. David Silverman is the Associate Director for Research, Markets, and Regulations. Prior to joining the CFPB in 2010, David served for 12 years as General Counsel and Executive Vice President of Kessler Financial Services. David began his career as a law clerk to Justice Thurgood Marshall. This morning, David will frame today's discussion about payday lending issues and introduce our panelists. David. Thank you, Cheryl, and good morning, everyone. Director Cordray has summarized for us the findings of the new research report that the Bureau has released today. And I should say that the full report is now available on our website, uh, www.consumerfinance.gov. And I would encourage anyone who's interested to go there and read the full report. And the director has also discussed some of the implications and concerns that arise from that report. And he's raised questions about how we can go about uh, establishing, assuring access to a small dollar credit market that's fair, transparent, and competitive. So to discuss these and other questions, we're joined by a distinguished panel. Let me briefly introduce them, and then we'll turn it over to them. So to my, they're seated, I should say, in alphabetical order. <laughs> to my far left, uh, is Pam Banks, Senior Policy Counsel for Consumers Union. To her right is Lynn DeVault, a board member for Check Into Cash. And to her right is Jamie Fulmer, Senior Vice President of Public Affairs for Advance America. Turning to the far right of the stage is Dr. Paige Skiba, Professor of Law at Vanderbilt Law School, an economist in the, on the law school faculty. To her left is Stephen Reeves, Associate Coordinator of Partnerships and Advocacy for the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. And to his left is Onisha Herring, Legislative Counsel for the Center for Responsible Lending. So we're going to ask each of the panelists to make a brief statement of two to three minutes, uh, and then we'll be able to moderate a discussion that Corey and Cheryl and I will, will facilitate with the panelists. So Pam, why don't you start? Good morning, Nashville. Um, thank you to Director Cordray for inviting me to participate in this important meeting. And as indicated, my name is Pamela Banks, and I'm Senior Policy Counsel for Consumers Union, the policy and advocacy arm of Consumer Reports. Consumers Union works with over a million activists to pass consumer protection laws in the states and in Congress. 
Our mission is to work for a fair, just, and safe marketplace for all consumers and to empower consumers to protect themselves. We call out corporations that harm consumers and encourage companies that are heading in the right direction. Most importantly, we listen to consumers. We regularly ask consumers about their experience in the marketplace. Payday loans are short-term loans that function as an advance on one's paycheck. While the loans are easily obtainable from a storefront lender or online, they can be very, very difficult to repay. Generally, the loan must be repaid in full, including interest and fees from the consumer's next paycheck, typically within two weeks. Since many of the applicants aren't able to repay the loans when they are due, they often are forced to roll over their loans for additional fees and find themselves owing much, much more than they originally borrowed. Consumers have complained to us about three-digit interest rates, high fees, and unauthorized withdrawals from their bank accounts to pay for payday loans. They have also told us how payday loans have increased their overdraft, led to delinquency on other debt, and depleted funds for necessities such as food, rent, clothing, and medical expenses. Consumers Union took a strong stance against banks making deposit advance loans, very similar to payday loans, that trap consumers into taking out debt they can't afford. We support federal guidance that required banks to regulate a consumer's ability to repay a loan without needing to borrow repeatedly from any source, including reborrowing to meet necessary expenses. We also support limits on the number of loans a consumer can take out in a year. We support requiring each deposit advance or payday loan to be repaid in full before a subsequent loan is made and we support banning automatic credit increases. In addition, we supported the guidelines set out by the Military Lending Act, which caps interest rates on payday, auto title, and tax refund loans to service members at 36% APR. We believe all Americans deserve the same protections. Finally, in the states, we work with AARP, the Coalition of Responsible Lending, and other consumer advocates in fighting for legislation that would provide better disclosures, reduce fees, and cap interest rates on payday lending. We look forward to working with the CFPB on this important issue, and I personally look forward to reading today's report. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Lynn? <clears throat> Thank you, David. Um, good morning. My name is Lynn DeVault. I'm president of Jones Management, which is an affiliate of Check into Cash. And as David mentioned, I'm on its board of directors. Check into Cash is a non-bank financial service provider. We offer check cashing, payday loans, title loans, money transfer, prepaid par cards, and almost anything that uh, the consumer might need in their financial life. Our, our company is based in Cleveland, Tennessee, and has more than 1,000 stores in about 30 states. Check into Cash is a founding member of the Community Financial Services Association. I served on the board of directors there since 2000, and I was chair, proudly so, for 10 of the last 14 years. I want to thank the CFBB for asking me to represent the industry on today's panel. CFSA's member companies represent more than half of the state-regulated licensed payday loan storefronts across the country. Over the period of, that I've served on the board, we developed and, and we uphold a strict set of best practices that contain certain consumer protections that exceed most of those con contained in state laws. These include, for example, a requirement to be licensed in every state where one operates and to follow every applicable state and federal law to provide full disclosure as required by TILA, to limit rollovers, to permit consumers to rescind a transaction if they decide it's not right for them, 
to follow appropriate collection procedures consistent with Fair Debt Collections Practices Act, and possibly the most important best practice which we offer is a, an extended payment plan at no charge to anyone who finds that they cannot repay their debt. As the Bureau examines and considers regulation for the small loan industry, Check and Cash and other members of CFSA remain available to share what we've learned about our customers' experiences and how current state regulatory framework can inform future federal policy. The individual and collective experiences of our companies over the last 15 years have taught us that no product is one size fits all. CFSA members have used this information to institute important consumer protections and to work legislatively to expand and diversify state regulated small loan products. This is evidenced in the best practices that we uphold and in our efforts just this year to pass new installment legislation in nine states where none currently exists. Tennessee was the first state in the nation to pass legislation regulating payday loans and reforms have been made to those laws over the years to establish important consumer protections. For example, in 2012, the state legislature passed reforms that required all online lenders to be licensed with the state. We're working with our Tennessee legislators and our regulators to expand credit options for consumers, enabling lenders in Tennessee to offer installment loans, which will allow customers to repay their loans over a longer term. Many borrowers who currently use payday loans may be better served or may prefer having a longer term loan. We're pleased to see the legislature considering the needs of these consumers. Tennessee is but one of the many states where we've seen reforms and changes made into law. The small loan industry itself is very dynamic and open to change. The companies that make up this industry are innovators and they know their, their customers and they seek to offer financial solutions to consumers who for a variety of reasons choose our services over those of a traditional bank. I support a well-reasoned discussion along with key stakeholders, lenders, borrowers, regulators, on how we can better serve and protect consumers. From that dialogue, we should come to a better and more complete understanding of how to provide access to credit and a variety of regulated products within the envelope of appropriate consumer protection. First, I support causing all lenders to register with CFPB. And second, I support codifying the, into rule the CFSA best practices, which are not followed by much, many of the lenders in the industry. The demand for small dollar short-term credit is deep and underserved by the banking community. A well-regulated non-bank industry is a goal we share with CFPB, and I look forward to continue to work toward that goal. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. <laughs> Next, Jamie Fulmer. Thank you, David, and, and thank you all for being here today. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you to share my thoughts on the complex issues of access to cost competitive, regulated, and transparent credit. Collectively, Lynn and I bring the unique perspective of almost 30 years of serving our customers in our stores across the country. Let me just say that I've met thousands of our customers in that time, and they're decent, hardworking folks who make a fully informed decision to choose the products and services that we offer relative to their other options in the marketplace. Regulated payday loans are just one of the choices the broader, in the broader marketplace that help customers bridge a gap in their finances. Every customer who walks in our door is different and they bring uh, a different reason for coming into our center and they use the product differently, all to meet their individual needs. Some have an emergency need while many are dealing with the periodic financial challenges of life. Regardless of what brings them into our centers, they are overwhelmingly satisfied with us and the services that we provide. As with any industry, the market for short-term credit continues to evolve. In fact, Banks' efforts to participate in this market are now limited only to the expensive overdraft programs following recent guidelines from the FDIC and the OCC. This is a disappointing development and one that the CFPB and other regulators should take note of. Banks, non-banks, not-for-profits, and others should all be encouraged, not discouraged, to 
participate in a regulated market that meets the needs of consumers. Case in point, the U.S. Postal Service, by report, is examining ways that it may be able to meet the unquestioned customer demand. We as a company welcome them into the marketplace, provided they, along with anyone else who's willing to provide customers with a product, are held to the same regulatory standards as we are. As with the product itself, the industry's evolution continues to include the addition of new products, such as installment loans for those who prefer to pay over a longer period of time. But I would caution that installment loans alone are not the answer. Customers deserve a mix of credit products, including a two-week product. Currently, half of the markets in which Advance America operates already have installment loans, but still many borrowers in those markets choose a traditional payday loan because it best meets their individual needs and preferences. A Harris Interactive national survey of actual customers who borrowed from regulated storefront lenders found that 98% are satisfied or very satisfied with the payday loan experience and 93% carefully weighed the benefits and risks before taking out a loan. Almost all have clear expectations both in the cost of the loan and the time that it takes them to repay. Further, we see very few complaints filed against our company with state or federal regulators. Last year alone, we responded to approximately 200 complaints out of close to a million, 11 million transactions. And many of those were scams perpetrated by illegal actors in no way affiliated with our company. This is a separate and important issue that deserves special regulatory attention. As the marketplace changes to meet consumer demand, the regulatory framework must also evolve. Up to this point, the focus has primarily been on restrictions placed on lenders. But now we need to focus on the customer to gain a better understanding of why Americans borrow and value short-term loans. Despite the intense pressure from special interest groups, regulators must avoid imposing rules that fail to consider how borrowers behave in the real world. Test lab concepts that are designed to constrict the ability to borrow from a regulated lender do nothing to alleviate the consumer's need for short-term credit. Families faced with a gap in their finances are forced into riskier options such as unregulated loans, which are available in every state and which thrive particularly where regulated borrowing options are not available or are severely limited. This should be a real concern to the Bureau and of policymakers in states that do not have a regulated environment. In fact, it should be noted that in his remarks, Director Cordray referenced a customer complaint from a customer in a state where payday, regulated payday lending does not exist. Today, we're here in Tennessee, which is one of 32 states that have recognized the realities faced by borrowers and carefully crafted laws that provide comprehensive consumer protections while still preserving access to credit. This morning's important discussion creates a pathway where the CFPB and others can work together to explore opportunities for collaboration with the collective goals of empowering American consumers, helping them make informed decisions, preserving their ability to access credit when they need it, and protecting them from unscrupulous, unregulated lenders. But the hard work goes far beyond the discussion we are having here in Nashville. Earlier this year, the CEO of Advance America called on the CFPB to establish a working group of banks, non-banks, credit unions, startup lenders, and other financial services providers to ensure a level regulatory playing field among providers and to conduct a thoughtful examination of American consumer credit. This is more important today than ever before. It is our sincere hope that the Bureau will strongly consider this suggestion and we stand ready to help. Our customers and the American consumer will be better off as a result. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jamie. Onisha? Good afternoon, and thank you to Director Cordray and the CFPB staff for inviting me here today. The Center for Responsible Lending is a research and policy organization dedicated to protecting home ownership and family wealth by working to eliminate abusive financial practices. We are an affiliate of Self-Help, one of the nation's largest nonprofit community development institutions. <laughs> Self-Help has provided over $6 billion in financing to low-income, rural, and minority families. CRL has worked extensively on the predatory aspects of payday lending. We base our work on facts. 
and the facts are clear. Payday loans are an inherently defective product that violates principles of fair and responsible lending for three main reasons. Number one, triple digit interest rates. Nationally, the typical payday loan is about $350 and carries an interest rate of 391%. In Tennessee, that rate is even higher. Here, a two-week $100 loan costs 460%. Tennesseans pay over $198 million in payday fees per year. Number two, payday loans are designed to cre create a long-term cycle of debt. For payday lenders, a good customer is a customer who cannot repay the loan without borrowing again. Rather than being a temporary solution, we found that most payday borrowers remained in debt an average of 212 days of the year. Number three, payday lenders completely ignore a borrower's ability to repay the loan. Instead, they rely solely on their ability to collect, often by having direct access to the borrower's bank account. Payday lending imposes a high cost on borrowers and communities. About half of payday borrowers eventually default, leaving them with no bank account, delinquent on other bills, or in the face of bankruptcy. And when families have no money to spend, how can they make their cities better off? Fortunately, public policy is trending against payday lending. 22 states prohibit or restrict payday loans. Not a single state has legalized payday lending since 2005. Congress has already prohibited payday loans for military service members and their families. And federal banking regulators now require banks to evaluate a borrower's ability to repay before making a loan. The few banks that were making payday loans have now exited the business. While the CFPB cannot limit interest rates, it can and should limit the length of time lenders can keep borrowers in debt and require that the lender evaluate a borrower's ability to repay the loan. It is time to end these debt trap loans and promote fair and affordable products that bring financial stability rather than financial agony. Thank you. Thank you, Anisha. Stephen? Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and to provide some perspective from my corner of the faith community. Thank you, Director Cordray and staff, for the very deliberate, research-based approach to this issue. As we have seen across the country, this industry is quite creative and sensitive to regulation. It is important that any new rules are done right, and I know that you are headed in the right direction. The data to release today, as well as the report last year, seem to confirm in the big picture what many of us have seen at the local level. In many ways, churches and other faith communities or on the front lines of family financial stability. One of the first stories I heard from a pastor when I began working on this issue in Texas nearly five years ago was about a young family in his church. When they came to him for a second time for financial assistance, the pastor and deacons decided to look into their situation, wondering why they continued to need help. What they found was a hole in the family's budget created by a payday loan. The father had taken out a $700 loan and $200 was being withdrawn from his checking account every two weeks. This had gone on for four and a half months. After paying $1,800 towards that $700 loan, they still had not reduced what they owed. When the church stepped in to help them out, they had to pay nearly $1,500 to pay off the loan. That's $3,300 for a $700 loan in less than five months. As my organization became known for working on these issues, we began to hear more stories to receive calls from desperate borrowers and learn of other similar situations from pastors and church members. We heard from a pastor who saw representatives of payday lenders approach adults with disabilities at the local mental health facility and give them loans based on their dis monthly disability checks. We heard from a pastor in South Dallas who watched his 10 payday and auto title, title lending storefronts cropped up near his church in a matter of months and the auto title borrower who had her car repossessed after paying $4,000 toward a $1,500 loan. When I describe these situations to folks unfamiliar with the practice, their first reaction is to often ask, how can this be legal? I've found that concerns for this issue cross lines that so often divide people. Lines of race, religion, ideology, and partisanship. People of faith and of no faith can agree scenarios like these are just flat out wrong. 
Unfortunately, the growing amount of research and data shows that these scenarios are more common than unusual. Research released by the CFPB in 2013 contained a chart which represents, I believe, the clearest snapshot of the problem. It showed that 75% of all fees generated by these products come from the 48% of borrowers who take out 11 or more loans a year. That is not a business model built on one-time, short-term emergency loans as they are marketed to the public and so sold to policymakers. These products are not loans in any traditional sense. They are instead self-perpetuating, fee-generating devices where there is a perverse incentive at work. The more the borrower fails, that is, has to pay only fees and interest to renew or roll over the loan, or results to a new loan after paying off a loan that was unaffordable for them in the first place, then the more money the lender makes. What has been referred to by many as the cycle of debt is the most profitable scenario for the lender. I also want to mention the growth in the multi-payment payday loan market that you've heard a little bit about here today. Data in Texas shows a rapid growth in these types of loans over the past few years. Today, you can take out a $1,000 loan with a 168-day term. You would then make 12 easy payments of every two weeks of over $245 each. That loan ends up costing $2,700. That is a 581% APR loan of nearly six months. While a loan with fixed payments and an end date seems like an improvement, at this cost, they are not a better product for the borrower. In addition, data now shows that many of these loans are refinanced. This shows little regard for, the ability, for their affordability and can create an almost endless cycle of refinances, much like the single payment product. These loans are really only a way to guarantee the same amount of fees as a traditional single payment loan rolled over eight times or more. What has taken place across the country is a systematic and deliberate dismantling of traditional usury laws to the detriment of working Americans and our communities. While laws and loopholes may be different across states, the products and practices are the same. Efforts to reform these laws will continue at the state level, but many in the faith community are pleased that the CFPB has the ability to promulgate rules nationwide and are eager to see new regulations that help create a more balanced marketplace, one that promotes both lender and borrower success. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. And finally, Paige. Thank you. Um, I'm an economist who teaches issues related to payday loans at Vanderbilt Law School, and I've dedicated my academic research to studying payday loans, title loans, and pawn shops. I wanted to highlight very briefly a couple of the issues that academics like me have thought about related to payday loans and what I hope will also be some future lines of research. I think some of these results might be quite surprising to the audience here today. The largest line of research on payday loans has been on the consequences of payday loans, and the results are very mixed. My own work shows that payday loans cause people to file bankruptcy more often than people, similar consumers who aren't able to borrow on payday loans. I've also shown that offering people larger payday loans help them repay rather than default or roll over, suggesting that payday loans might actually help borrowers uh, smooth their finances uh, through the month. Similar researchers have found very mixed results as well. And so what I take from this line of research is that Payday loans are not all good or bad. They help some consumers, and they can have devastating consequences on other consumers. And so I see policy solutions to this as very difficult. I don't envy the Bureau trying to come up with policies related to payday loans. The story I take from this line of research, beyond the fact that there's a lot of different consequences to different types of borrowers, is that there's really a strong, unrelenting demand for small dollar credit. This, led me, this fact led me to my most recent research, which has followed payday loan borrowers for months and years before they end up borrowing on a payday loan. One issue that I see as very absent from the conversation between academics, policymakers, the industry, and consumer advocates is how people end up 
at the payday loan shop in the first place. What I've shown in this line of research is quite devastating, I would say. People who, in the months and years leading up to people borrowing on payday loans, these consumers have consistently very low credit scores in the bottom 25% of all Americans and falling. Those credit scores are decreasing leading up to the time they show up at the payday lender. All other measures of financial health, so the number of credit card delinquencies, maxing out your credit card, applying for a credit card and being denied, mortgage delinquencies are increasing at the time that people show up at the payday lender. So I think an important question for us today, for academics going forward, is how we can help people avoid needing to borrow on these very expensive loans in the first place. That raises another issue that I've been spending my more recent academic work on, is what are the alternatives? Typically, we think of those as pawn shops, idle auto title loans, installment loans. Those also have many benefits and potentially even worse consequences than payday loans. So, um, the two issues that I hope we think about moving forward is how people end up needing to borrow on these very short-term expensive loans in the first place and what the best mix of products we could provide um, customers. I have, a, I guess, a sort of pessimistic story about policy solutions. I've done a lot of research on what can help people make better decisions in the payday loan world. Information disclosures don't seem to be effective. They're either confusing in themselves, provide too much information, and so borrowers completely ignore them, or they're not addressing the underlying issues, mistakes people make in their financial decisions in the first place. Financial literacy can be helpful, but it's very expensive and hard to provide at the very right time, the right moment for people to make better decisions. Rollover bans are hard to um, enforce. My most recent paper shows that extending the length of a payday loan, suppose we force lenders to give people two pay cycles rather than the typical one, that makes no difference in the probability people default on their loan or roll over. So this is a very, sh um, consumers have a very short time frame with which they're making the decisions. So I look forward to the um, discussion today. Um, it's very difficult question, the appropriate regulation of payday loans, I see more drawbacks to many of the proposals than benefits. So I'm curious to hear what the other panelists and what the audience has to say. Thank you. So thank you, Paige. Let me thank all the panelists for their thoughtful remarks and for staying within the time limits uh, a lot. And we're actually three minutes ahead of schedule. <laughs> Unprecedented. <laughs> So Paige, since you're uh, on a roll here, let me start with you and I'll get to ask the first question. You talked a little bit about the research that exists both as to uh, the consumers who use payday loans and the long-term effect on them of their payday loan usage. Can you add a little more flavor as to what the research tells us on those two dimensions? Yeah, so I mentioned a couple of my own papers. One shows that Payday loans cause an increase in personal bankruptcy rates. So we know from studies like the one released today by the Bureau that people are heavily indebted for a long amount of time, often paying more in interest than they borrowed in the first place. Other studies have shown that payday loans help avoid, help people avoid bouncing checks, which can be very costly. Um, they can help people make utility bill payments to avoid um, getting their loans shut off. So there's at least a dozen papers looking at the consequences of payday loans, and there's really no um, consensus, unfortunately, about the overall consequences. As I said before, they seem to help some people or have no effect, and then at the same time have very devastating consequences for other people. So I would like the phrase the director used about prever preserving access to payday loans, because I see banning payday loans as potentially having worse consequences on net. So it's a difficult question. But. Thanks. So we'll sort of take turns asking questions. I'll turn now to Cheryl Parker-Rose to ask the next question. Thank you, David. Anisha, you t identified three big problems that you see with payday loans. Can you dig a little deeper and talk about how those f features adversely affect the consumer? Yeah, I would say that there's many, there are many problems with payday loans, but the central feature is that they're made without regard to the borrower's ability to repay the loan. Essentially, lenders do not look at their income, other expenses, or any other evaluation to determine whether this loan is affordable for consumers. And data repeatedly shows 
data from CRL, the CFPB, and even the industry's own data, that the whole business model depends on the borrower's inability to repay and the likelihood that they will become trapped in this cycle of debt. Um, the lender has no incentive to, to evaluate the borrower's ability because they have first in line direct access to the bank account. Um, taking the borrower's money as soon as it hits, often before any of their other expenses or debt is paid. Um, the triple digit interest rates bolster the effects of payday lending. And these big features together, no underwriting, not looking at the borrower's expenses or income, direct access to their bank account, and then the 400% interest rate add up to a particularly damaging effect that already struggling borrowers, that leave already struggling borrowers worse off. In fact, repaying these loans and the high fees associated usually leave borrowers with not enough money to pay for the basic, basic necessities such as rent or food. Thank you. Corey? It's my turn. So I have a question for Jamie. We've seen single payment payday loans uh, around for uh, over 20 years. But what are the trends in new loan product developments and how will the market look in the next few years and what is driving these kinds of innovations? Um, well, first of all, if I, if I knew what the next five years looked like, I probably wouldn't be sitting here. I'd be in Vegas, uh, <laughs> you know, bet, betting on the future. Um, you know, I, I think it's a great question. Um, you know, I think if, uh, if you look at the core, one, I, I think that the demand will continue. There'll continue to be a need for access to short-term credit. Uh, I, I think you will see in the next five years technology continue to evolve the marketplace. Uh, I think you'll see uh, the consumer continue to dictate the types of products and services that they will. I, I think that um, you know what we've seen from our perspective as a provider that the, the marketplace works best when we create a framework that allows the customer to have a continuum of credit where they have the flexibility to move up and uh, down the chain as it relates to individual products so that they can find the product that meets their individual need at any given time. So I think at its core that will be, you know, a, an important feature and I think that will not be unique to, uh, you know, you know uh, non-bank providers like Advance America. Hopefully that will include uh, banks and credit unions. Hopefully that will include not-for-profit institutions. Hopefully that will include the technological startups that you see in the marketplace. Possibly it will include the, the postal service. Um, but again, I think, uh, as I mentioned in my remarks, all of that has to be cased under the same um, uh, framework of regulations that are equal and consistent. And, and I think what we see in the marketplace, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the big gaps is that there seems to be a lack of appreciation in general for how the customer looks at credit products. We need to be looking at the customer who has a need for short-term credit and what their options are in that marketplace and how they evaluate those options and then build the regulatory framework around the customer. As I mentioned, we talk about restrictions on the lender, but we ought to be talking about how we design products that, that meet the customer's needs regardless of who the provider, are, who the provider is. So I think, I think that's where I would see the marketplace go in the next five years and quite frankly, probably beyond that. Thank you. Stephen, let me ask you a question. You talked uh, quite eloquently about some of the situations you had experienced uh, in Texas in particular. I'm asking if you can sort of generalize a little bit from that and discuss what you think are the primary consumer protection issues uh, in the payday and small dollar lending market. Sure, thank you. Um, among the many issues, I'd say uh, two things really, and the first kind of echoes what Anisha said, and that is a total lack of assessment of a borrower's ability to repay. People are given loans priced so high that they are set up for failure. And again, the more they fail to make the lump sum payment, the more fees they pay to roll over the loan, the more money the lender makes. So it's no wonder that the lenders are not concerned with affordability when they can just cash the check, directly access the bank account, or repossess the car. If money is withdrawn from the account, as the data released today shows, then the borrowers will have a hard time making it to the next payday and must resort to another loan. The second thing I'll mention goes to the lender communications with customers and their understanding of the product. Since the products are not loans in any traditional sense, I've heard again and again that borrowers had no idea that when they were making payments, paying money every two weeks on their loan, that they were not reducing what they owe. 
I think that's a fundamental uh, misunderstanding initially from a lot of customers that I've seen. It takes a while to understand that those very high payments that they are trying to do their best to be responsible and pay back are actually not reducing what they owe. Corey? So for Pam, um, what do you see as the biggest challenge for consumers going forward in satisfying their small dollar credit needs? Thank you, Corey. I think Director Cordray summed it up beautifully this morning. In my view, the biggest challenge for consumers going forward is finding a short-term loan, because indeed there is a need for short-term loans, but a product that is safe, transparent, and affordable based on sound underwriting standards that demonstrate an ability to repay the loan or to afford the loan rather than the ability to collect the loan. I know um, we at CU are looking very closely at the postal service, as my colleague mentioned earlier, um, postal, post offices offering financial services, and presumably they would be offering small dollar loans as well. So we're looking for ways to steer consumers to a safe, product and we advocate for any new innovations that are coming to the marketplace to be mindful of these protections for consumers because there's no denying there is a need out there. Our job is to make certain that that product is safe. Thank you. Cheryl? Cheryl? Thank you, David. I'm going to piggyback off of uh, Corey's question and I'd like to direct a question to you, Lynn. You talked about the need for the adoption of best practices across the industry. And I think, Jamie, you also said the consumer perspective should drive the regulatory framework. So for Pam, I'd like to ask you, what would you identify as some of the biggest challenges that the industry faces? Thank you. Um, you know, I, 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 I've said to several people this morning, you know, one of the challenges the industry has is it's, it's built um, uh, layers of state regulation over the last 20 years that, you know, in hindsight are not always the most effective. For example, um, and most people don't look at the APR on a loan, they look at the fee they pay on a loan, but that fee is the same whether it's one week or 10 days or 14 days. Could have been, you know, a percent a day or it could have been structured a different way, but here we're kind of locked into uh, a regulatory framework that we're now spending time trying to improve. So when I say, for example, that we're making efforts to pass installment legislation, I don't mean the kind of installment legislation that you don't like with credit life, with disability, with car clubs, with all that. I mean regular unsecured installment loans. Why? Because some consumers do need longer to repay. I mean, we don't, we don't disagree with the conclusions that consumers in some cases have chosen a product uh, that doesn't always fit their need. But the challenge is, and you know, you could debate whether uh, payday loans were small dollar credit or whether they were short term loans. Because in reality, if you look at the patchwork of state law, what you find is that what we call payday loans are small dollar credit because they're, you know, they go up to a certain level and they're limited there and then the installment loan starts above that. And there, there's not a good integration of product offering. I think Jamie mentioned this. I mean, all of our concern should be in designing product and providing product that fits the consumer's need. So um, the challenge in the industry, because the industry is a big supporter of legislative change and of regulatory change, is to work very closely with legislatures across the country and to work very closely with CFPB and other regulators to really understand what kind of products consumers need and how we can get there from here. And I'd emphasize one more time, you mentioned best practices. Every member of CFSA, now this is half of the storefront lenders, and all of our companies also offer loans on the internet that are state regulated. We all offer an extended payment plan for the, no additional fees. All the consumer has to do is ask. So from a math perspective, let me tell you what that means. If you have a two week loan and you come into the store or you call and say, I can't pay, we would automatically give you another four pay periods to pay. 
Well, that, if, if, for those of you who want to talk about APR, which, you know, really isn't sensible on a short-term loan, would be sensible if the loan was outstanding all year, but generally they're not, you know, that effectively cuts the APR in thirds. And so I, I think that it is our effort to try to accommodate what consumers need and demand and our efforts to work legislatively and regulatorily to make this work. Because when you think about payday lending, you know, it's a relatively new industry, but it, there is much demand for short-term credit, or is there much demand for small dollar credit? Because neither small dollar credit or short-term credit is accommodated by banks. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. <laughs> So we're coming towards the close of our panel discussion, but I want to end with one question which I'll ask each of the panelists to comment on, and it really follows on the question that Corey asked Pam and Cheryl asked Lynn uh, from a slightly different perspective. Really the question is, what do you think consumers should do or consider doing, consider before taking out uh, a payday or other kind of small dollar loan? And why don't we go in the reverse order we did last time. So Paige, we'll start with you this time. Well, first, I would say that consumers, all of us are over optimistic, so we all think we're better drivers than the median driver. I actually am a really good driver. I never had any moving violations, but <laughs> <laughs> consumers don't, even if they completely understand the loan terms and the consequences, they don't predict that they're going to roll over their loan five times, four times. You can see that is a really consistent fact in the reports that the CFPB and other researchers have put out. And so I guess I would tell consumers to be a little bit more realistic about their own behavior. I study the psychology of decision making in consumer context, and this is this over-optimism, misprediction about your future ability to repay and your future um, patience or self-control is really overwhelming part of the problem here. Stephen? So I would agree with that in large part and say that um, they might want to ask themselves what happens if I can't pay this off or if I can pay it off, can I make it to the next paycheck, first of all. Um, and then I think they would uh, ought to consider other options if, if they have some available uh, family members, uh, their church, if, if possible, some churches are looking into alternative products or, or, or benevolence funds. I would also suggest um, possibly a credit union or uh, another financial institution because I think there is a there is a problem that not enough banks are offering competitive products or needs to be more but there are some out there and so I would say look hard for uh, something else first I would if I could I would put a caution light in front of every payday lending storefront that yellow that says beep 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 caution 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 because the reality is most of these most borrowers who um, take out these loans, end up deeper in debt, and have further financial hardships. Um, these loans do not solve anything, um, and the, the idea that it's a quick solution for um, emergencies is flawed. It's usually used to supplement income for routine expenses, and it digs folks deeper in debt. Um, so the reality is cus customers should, or consumers should avoid using these loans at all costs. Well, for, you agree with that, James? No. <laughs> first, first of all, uh, you know, I think one of the things that we've done extraordinarily well as an industry, uh, and is one thing we pride ourselves in, is the simple, transparent, and full disclosure that we offer to our customers. If you compare the, the, the products and services in our centers to just about any other financial instrument that a customer avails themselves of, you will find that, that we are the most straightforward and easy for them to understand. So I think that is, is an important part of helping the customer evaluate the costs, the fees, the terms of any of the credit products or any of the other products that they are considering when they have a short-term uh, financial difficulty, whether it's a payday loan, whether it's overdraft protection, or whether it's the late fee associated with paying their water bill late if they don't have the money necessary to do it. So I think those are all things that, that help the customer evaluate the benefits and risks associated with any credit product. 
And as, as um, Senator Warren used to say, help the customer avoid the tricks and traps that, that uh, can lie on the road to uh, getting a credit product they need. That's where we try to stand as an industry, as an association, and as a company. And we think that the rest of the financial services industry should come along with us. I, I think I would add to that that um, we support financial literacy. Our industry in Tennessee contributes to foundation that provides uh, financial literacy, and the best consumer is an informed, informed uh, and knowledgeable consumer. And then I would say that consumer should take responsibility for their decisions. And, you know... <laughs> I, I think just like we saw problems in the mortgage industry where all of us on this panel could go and get an adjustable rate loan at a very low rate and when interest rates went up, some of us might not have been able to afford that house. That's our responsibility. Every consumer needs to take responsibility for themselves. So I, I, think, um, I think if they have the basic building block of financial education in schools as we do here in Tennessee and they have the ability to budget, they have the ability to understand what they need, they're not too optimistic so they know when they can pay it back. That's the key and that's what I would tell consumers as they consider any credit product that they might be looking at. And finally, Pam. Um, one of the advantages of being last is that you can easily say, I associate myself with all my, the comments from my colleagues. Um, <laughs> well, you can't think of anything new. <laughs> right, okay. exactly. Because there is no inconsistency. I think all of the things that were mentioned are extremely important. Um, certainly, in my book, you just got to understand the cost of what you're taking out for this payday loan, or any loan for that matter. So ask the questions, get the information, make sure you're getting information that you can understand and that's meaningful. And then a word of caution, I would say also beware of internet payday lending because of added security and privacy risk. You know, as borrowers, we supply bank account numbers, social security numbers, and other sensitive financial and personal information electronically via loan applications. Well, that makes it easier to transfer, transmit the information, but it also makes it easier to steal. So, thank you. So that concludes the panel a portion of this morning's program. Let me ask you to join me in thanking all of our panelists one more time for a thoughtful and thought-provoking conversation. And I'll invite the panelists, if they can take their seats back in the audience, uh, and I'll turn it over to Zixto Martinez, our Associate Director for External Affairs, uh, who will moderate the next portion of the program. Thank you, David, and thank you all who joined us today at CFPB's field hearing in Nashville. We're spending a couple of days in Nashville to do what we've been doing throughout the country, which is to hear from consumers directly, directly from industry representatives, from community advocates, and many others. A number of you have signed up to share comments and observations about today's discussion on payday lending, and to tell the CFPB about what's happening in your community. This is an opportunity to make sure we understand the consumer finance trends and practices in your neighborhoods, in your communities. Each person who signed up to provide testimony will have two minutes to provide that testimony. And what we hear from you is invaluable and we want to hear from everyone who signed up. So I encourage you to please observe the two minute limit so that we hear from every single person who signed up to provide testimony and to tell us what's happening in their community. So why don't we get started? 
Um, one of our staff members, either Laura or Carlos, will bring a mic to you. Please tell us who you are. Our first audience participant is Molly Fleming. Molly, would you please raise your, thank you. Hi, I'm Molly Fleming Pierre with Communities Creating Opportunity in Kansas City and Missouri Faith Voices. We represent 300 congregations across Missouri, a state that experiences a 317 million uh, debt drain every single year as a result of payday fees. Um, I came because I promised the people I work with I would bring their stories in this room. Um, so I came and I'll talk about as many people as I can before I hit my two minutes. Um, I came because Elliot Clark is a disabled Vietnam veteran and he is a good man. And if he was a current active duty member who wasn't disabled, he would actually be covered by uh, the Military Lending Act, but he's not. And he is a man who has five beautiful daughters and a wife who broke her ankle. And when she broke her ankle and she could no longer work, he took out a payday loan to cover the mortgage. And when that payday loan spiraled, he took out another payday loan to try to cover the mortgage and keep the family home and keep his daughter in college. And when he was at the payday lending shop, they suggested he take out three more payday loans just to make sure he could cover all of his bills. Elliot Clark took out five payday loans that he spiraled in for five years. He paid $30,000 in debt and he lost his home. That is what we're dealing with every single day in Missouri. And I am grateful for you being here um, from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau to hear these stories because there are millions more just like them in Missouri. Um, I'm here because of Sandra, a disabled woman um, who has a third grade education and was targeted outside of the, the, um, the place of work where they knew that she was a disabled individual who could barely read. Trapped her in a consumer installment loan, she paid $15,000. Took an advocate to get her out of it. So I bring those folks into this room and I thank you for hearing their testimony. Thank you, Ms. Fleming. <laughs> Beverly James. Michael Allen. Good morning, my name is Michael Allen. I'm with Catholic Charities of West Tennessee and I'm here to, today uh, to speak to you as a representative of Memphis and West Tennessee. Our work at Catholic Charities focuses on veterans, at-risk children and seniors, homeless men and women, and immigrants. Increasingly, the number of clients that we work with report finding themselves caught up in this almost inescapable web of payday loan type products. And while there are multiple stories I too could tell, I'll share just one. This gentleman's name is Roy. He too happens to be a Vietnam veteran era uh, Navy man, 62 years old. And he came into our program for homeless veterans and their families last year, having recently had his truck repossessed due to his falling behind in payments to a title loan company. The title loan was one of two such predatory financial products he had outstanding. The other was to a check advance company and he was behind on both. As a self-employed painter by trade, the loss of Roy's truck further exacerbated his predicament as the truck was critical to transporting his painting materials to various work sites. Ultimately, he found himself without income and homeless, couch, search, couch surfing with friends. Roy is not alone. A simple Google search just yesterday of the term payday loans Memphis generated over 225 different physical locations of payday loan, check cashing, title loan type storefronts in our community. That's more than triple the combined number of Walgreens, CVS, Target, Walmart, and Kroger stores in the same community. Through our national organization, Catholic Charities USA, we are partnering with and appreciate the support of the CFSB, or C CFPB, and others in growing our asset development efforts. And in the absence of stronger legislative or regulatory efforts, we are working to provide broader financial literacy to our clients in such areas as basic budgeting, the role of credit, and common financial pitfalls to avoid. And clearly, predatory loan products fall into this last category. I thank you for your time today. Thank you, Mr. Allen. <clears throat> Alicia Brown.
Good afternoon. My name is Alicia Brown. I work with the Payday Loan Company. I've been in business for 12 years. And for every story that you pull through here today with the horror story of how horrible we are, there, there are dozens more success stories. Yes, this is a viable product. Yes, we do need it. Is it for everyone? It's just like Lynn and Jamie said. It is not a one size fit all. You know, we are in an evolving industry. We are looking for more ways to get, get oh, I thought you were, <laughs> give money to, um, to be able to get money to our customers. A payday loan is a short term loan. It is designed to help you with whatever life problem you have going on at that time. No, it is not meant to be continued for 12 months. And an APR for a, for a short-term, two-week loan, 30-day loan, or whatever, to discuss a 30-day or a, um, an annual PR with it, it, it makes no sense. That is why we would have, you know, like the installment loans that Lynn spoke about, to be able to fit those customers that can see that they are not able to pay a loan off in 30 days. But they must accept responsibility. There are, it's for the people that get their stuff repossessed or, or whatever has happened that have had to have them go to their churches, there are customers that will come to us with no intention to pay back. We do not, in, you know, we can't increase our rate. You know, we have the same operating expenses as any other business in the community, but we, we can't raise our rent. You know, we can't, we can't charge an extra fee for this or that. We have to pay our bills and still be able to operate within that fee that we charge those customers. And many customers do not ever walk back in our door once we hand them money. You know, th they are gone. We, you know, it's, it's a high, high risk that we take. If we didn't, you know, they would be able to go to the bank and get a 6% annual rate, but they can't. We, we are gambling on them and we, we have to collect our money back. No, we're not going to go break legs or threaten a firstborn or anything like that, but we, we expect them to come back in. So that means that we have to make wise loans to these customers. We, can, we, we do look at income and, and how much do you make and such like that. We would lose all of our customers. We would give them money. We would never get it back. We would never see them again. You know, if we were as horrible as, way, as the way we are portrayed. It's, it's just not factual. There are unscrupulous lenders. There are unscrupulous people in all industries. It's not just ours, but people love to parade the most horriblest of stories to you and let you think that that's the way our industry is, and it's not. Your examiners have been in our locations. You've, you've heard our customers. We, we, we help them. We, we, we provide something for them that they cannot go to another place and get. And I believe that we need to be able to provide to them. If it's not on a 14-day basis, you know, if that's, if that's not the product for them, let us offer them something. Those 22 states that do not offer payday lending, do you really, really honestly think that they are not getting that money from some other place? Thank you, Ms. You're Brown. You're wearing rose-colored glasses. Stephen Taturka. Good afternoon. My name is Stephen Taturka. Um, I'm an attorney in private practice here in Tennessee. <clears throat> Forgive me, I've got a bit of a cold today. Um, uh, I've been doing this for about 20 years, representing primarily low-income consumers. Before that, I was an assistant attorney general in the Tennessee uh, Consumer Protection Division in the AG's office. Before that, I was in the Indiana Attorney General's office doing similar work. And before that, I was a legal services attorney. I came out of legal services. I started in legal services. Um, uh, uh, right out of law school in 1977. And at that time in this country, we still had a framework for usury limits. And I've seen over the last 34 years that's completely disintegrated. Uh, some of it started with a Supreme Court decision in the late 70s having to do with credit card interest rates. But even that, never, never uh, did, did I imagine that banks would be charging interest rates in the 400 and something percent interest rate uh, uh, realm that we're in today. Um, to me, the payday loan industry, the automobile title point industry, these are examples of the complete erosion of usury protection that we've had uh, for years up until, say, the last 20 years. 
And I think as a society, we have to ask ourselves a moral question, which is how high is too high? Now, the industry claims that the annual percentage rate is irrelevant because these are short-term loans, but as many of the panelists uh, have, have acknowledged this morning, these loans get turned over, over and over again. No restaurant stays in business by selling a grand total of one meal to one person per year. These businesses don't stay in business doing one two-week loan to one customer per year. Um, uh, I think Onisha from the Center for Responsible Lending mentioned earlier some of the limitations that Congress has placed on loans to service members. And the Military Lending Act limits interest rates to our service members to 36% annual percentage rate. And, and I applaud Congress for doing that. I mean, for all the dysfunction that Congress has shown over the last few years, at least they got their act together on that. On both sides of the aisle, they decided that 36% was the maximum we were going to allow our service members to be charged. And I agree with that, but my question is, what about everybody else? Why isn't everybody else entitled to those same protections? Are we somehow, is everybody else a second class citizen and they should be charged 460%, which incidentally is what it comes out to uh, on the, on the uh, Tennessee statute. The industry says they want to be regulated. They're willing to be licensed, they're willing to agree to best practices rules and things like that. But the one thing the industry will never agree to is a regulation on the interest rate. And to me, it's a little dishonest to say we're willing to be regulated, but yet we're not willing to be regulated on the most important aspect of this. And one of the frustrations I have is when I look at the Tennessee Title Point Statute, when I look at the Tennessee Payday Loan Statute, and I see the terminology that they use, and these statutes were clearly industry-sponsored bills, they use language that says that these fees shall not be considered interest for any purpose of law. Well, of course it's interest. You borrow money, you pay extra to, to use it for some length of time, and you pay that back. Of course it's interest. Thank you, Mr. Taturka. Thank you. Blake Sims. Good afternoon. My name is Blake Sims. I'm a partner with the law firm Hudson Cook in, in its Chattanooga, Tennessee office. We focus our practice exclusively on advising consumer finance companies on compliance matters. We work every day with responsible providers of consumer credit. These companies spend considerable time and resources to provide financial products that consumers want and need. They provide these products while complying with federal, state, and even local laws and regulations. These companies are continually innovating to offer more options to address consumer need. Allowing companies freedom to innovate and serve all consumers, not just consumers that the government believes need credit. Uh, under the umbrella of a regulatory environment focused on clear, accurate, and conspicuous disclosures should be the goal of the CFPB. Eliminating credit options is never the solution. Neither is forcing lenders to offer products that are simply not economically viable. The FDIC small dollar pilot program attempted this and the program failed. In the absence of options, consumers are forced to turn to inferior alternatives or have no alternatives at all. Options allow consumers to control their own financial situations. The Tennessee model, which allows various options and which the legislature is working now to increase those options, has worked, and consumer complaints are extremely low. We suggest the CFPB consider the Tennessee model when developing federal policy. We also suggest the CFPB consider, as did Don Morgan from the New York Federal Reserve, where these consumers would be without a short-term credit option. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sims. James Kirby. James Kirby, James E. Kirby, Belita Howard, Bob Rise, Bob Rees. <laughs> but I will use it. I know some of the people on the panel. I know, I know Brenda. 
and I knew, know Governor Cooper. I know they all have good intentions, but folks, the road to hell is paved by good intentions. And I, as a disabled Army veteran, am offended at you people, anybody for whatever reason, using the military and the veterans to justify your positions. The disabled veteran is the responsibility of our federal government, and specifically their commander in chief to take care of them. And it's a shame that they don't do it. But every one of us that ever served in the military took an oath to defend our Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. We are willing to defend it with our legs, with our lives. And that's what I'm here to speak about. You come out with federal regulations and you force it upon the American people as though it's law. And you enforce it as though it's law. Our Constitution in Article 1, Section 7 says the only way to pass a federal law is for both houses of Congress to pass it. Those of us who took that oath to defend the Constitution and who believe in it have a moral obligation to ignore your federal regulations. They are not the law of the land. I don't care whether it's good intentions or bad intentions. We need to stop that. We need to have our government start following our Constitution. Thank you. Out of the interest of fairness, which I heard up there a lot, Jim Cooper got name recognition. I'm Bob Reese and I'm running for Congress in the 5th Congressional District. <laughs> Those of you who believe our government should follow the Constitution and not spend more money than they take in, it's Bob Reese for Congress.com. Check me out. Reese is spelled R I E S. Thank you, Mr. Reese. <laughs> Sonia Jones. Jeez. That's Sonia Jones. Hello, my name is Sonia Jones, and I've been working with the payday loan industry for about eight years. Um, some of my customers wanted to be here today, but their jobs would not let them. And I just want to share some of the things that, you know, they wanted me to share with you guys. We help our customers. I mean, we have customers that come in there. I mean, they cry. <laughs> you know, they have no way to get help for what they need help for. I mean, I've had customers bring me stuffed animals, roses, after I have helped them through their situation, whether it is emergency or whether it is just life obstacles. So please don't let that interfere with what we are doing to help the customers. We explain everything to the customer. We don't let one customer walk out that don't know exactly what they're getting into, exactly what they're looking for. I mean, we're not here to try to do anything like that to the customers. We just are trying to help the customers where no one else will help the customers. And they enjoy that. And I enjoy my job because it makes me happy when I'm able to help someone else. And I'm emotional and they get emotional. And it's, it's just, you know, it's a thing that we're helping someone that no one else would. So... That is what we do, and we explain what we're doing. Thank you, Ms. Jones. <laughs> Dwayne Carson. Thank you very much for the open forum. My name is Dwayne Carson. I'm with Center for American Racial Equality. Uh, I respectfully have to, have to disagree with you, Director. I think payday loans are a needed option. Payday loans provide choice, and payday loans are an integral part to the safety net in the minority community. And if you further regulate the payday loan industry, you're sending a message to the minority community that they are not smart enough to make their own financial decisions for themselves and for their families. Let's leave it up to them. Let's leave it up to the individuals because contrary to what people believe in DC, people in the minority community are smart enough than what the government gives them credit for. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Carson. <laughs> Charles Kirby. Good afternoon. Thank you to the CPFB and also to the loan industry that participated in the panel. I think it's valuable. 
I'm a city councilman in Decatur, Alabama. Last year we passed a moratorium barring new, new payday loan companies coming in. We've since extended it and we're currently working on zoning restrictions to negate the negative aspects it creates in our community. I'll pass the other things I was going to say. I hope to impact you to continue to work with the federal and the state governments to reform and regulate the industry. To urge you to do that, I will give you one thing to look at before I close. To show you the effect it has in your communities, for those of you who are appointed, those of you who are elected, those of you who are not, talk to those that are, and have them go to your local city and ask how many of your municipal employees are suffering the negative impact of the payday loan industry through garnishments, court judgments, or otherwise. The number will surprise you. It should shock you. But it should guarantee you that we have need of reform and regulation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kirby. Jesse Johnson. Thank you, panel. Um, I've listened to a lot of the discussions and presentations from the CFPB uh, over the last couple of years at different forums, and it's been nice that they've been participating in industry groups, and they seem very open to talking with us that participate in the industry, uh, and I appreciate that. But when I listen to some of the discussions, it seems somewhat apparent to me that we tend to forget one important thing about the American consumer. Uh, the American consumer is an expert at finding the best deal. We will stand outside in a blizzard for eight hours on Black Friday to save 20 bucks on a crock pot. So, I mean, that's, uh, that's kind of funny, but the point is the amount of effort that the American consumer will put in to try to save themselves some money is evidence to me that they are a smart shopper. Uh, there's been tremendous competition in the small loan industry. Uh, it has expanded, but like any other business, that expansion has created fierce competition for those new customers. It may be the term of the product, it may be the pricing of the product, it may be the structure um, that these companies are competing with one another upon, but as competition increases, the consumers continue to have more options, and these people are major league shoppers. So I would urge the panel to consider what alternatives may or may not exist for these major league shoppers in the marketplace. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Thank you. Beth Campbell. Hi, I'm just here as a uh, consumer and a uh, interested uh, in this discussion. Thank you for being in Nashville, Tennessee. One comment I've heard today, and I've read other places, is that the U.S. Post Office is thinking about getting into this uh, business. My comment would be that the Post Office is not on sound financial footing. And I can't imagine why they would want to embark on something this complex. And I would really uh, suggest that they don't go that direction. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Andrew Langer. Andrew Langer. Hello, my name is Andrew Langer. I am president of the Institute for Liberty. We're a DC-based advocacy organization that focuses on the impact of regulation on business. And it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I have to say, though, I was a little distressed by Chairman Cordray's comments and some of the comments by people on the panel. Not by so much what he said or what you said, sir, but what, by what you left out. Uh, one of the things that I, I am discouraged by is this perpetuation of this myth of the 
300, 400% APR, and that this is somehow unique to the payday lending industry. If you look at a family that takes out a $100,000 mortgage on their home over the course of 30 years, they're going to pay another almost $200,000 on that loan. Yet nobody considers that usury. But what's even more disturbing to me is the fact that we're not talking about regulation of this industry. We're talking about destroying an entire industry in the financial services sector and replacing it with some weird combination of the post office and community activist-based lending institutions. Now, right now, who's on the hook when someone defaults on a loan? The businesses themselves. Who would be on the hook once the American government takes over this industry? The American taxpayers, that's exactly right. To the tune of tens of billions of dollars potentially every year. We cannot and should not let this happen. If you want to regulate, go ahead and, and fix the problem by, by changing rules. But don't destroy an entire sector and apply what is essentially a 19th century institution to a 21st century problem. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Langer. Alti Jordan. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Alti Jordan. I am the executive director for 18th Avenue Family Enrichment Center. We are a child care education center, and I'm here to kind of talk to you about how these particular facilities help the community. We are in partnership with, um, with a, a facility of this nature, and over the course of the last five years that I've been there, they've done nothing but help the community um, through giving back as far as uh, collecting food for families who need food, giving to our uh, toy store donation, which giving toys and things for children at Christmas, um, coming in and doing um, just projects of uh, beautifying our center, viewing, beautifying um, our grounds for our children and our families. So even though you're talking about the negative things that these thing, that these facilities are offering, I want you to know that they are doing great things within the community and they are needed within our community um, for things of that nature. And so I just want to say thank you for all of those things that they're doing, not only for us, but for other facilities within and around our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jordan. Thomas Stevenson. Uh, I'm Thomas Stevenson, and I'm uh, here today as a consumer. Uh, and, and I want to comment directly on what the CFPB is doing. Uh, the CFPB is an excellent and a perfect example of uh, the federal government overreaching and overregulating uh, what is supposed to be free markets. Uh, you know, kind of the paradox uh, of y'all coming here today, I'm very glad that y'all are here in Tennessee, because in Tennessee we pay our bills. Uh, we operate on a balanced budget, and uh, my household operates on a balanced budget. Uh, Washington doesn't seem to understand that, and, and I'm sure that they could use some of your financial classes on, on how to avoid bad credit, uh, which is kind of the, the paradox of this situation. But I, I'm more concerned with, with this overreaching and overregulation because this is a, bu a bureau uh, that was derived from the Dodd-Frank Act, if I'm not mistaken, which was created uh, to, to regulate the mortgage lending industry, uh, which is not what we're here doing today. Uh, so it's another example of government bureaucracy uh, continuing to grow. Uh, I'm very upset that our taxpayer dollars are going to groups like this to overregulate uh, a land that's supposed to be free markets. And, and I'd be very interested to know uh, how much of our tax dollars were spent uh, on this event today. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. Don Gowan. Thank you. My name is Don Gowan. I'm from Decatur, Alabama. Uh, I uh, agree with the lady up here, Ms. Heron. Uh, she made all the remarks, so I'm not going to make any of that uh, derogatory or positive. What I'd like to say to you is this. Uh, I've been in the traditional consumer lending business for 50 years, more than some of you in here before you were born. Uh, I was here when uh, uh, the Truth and Lending Act first came out. 
And, and uh, standing up here as a lender, you're going to say, well, he's crazy as a basketball. But I believe that uh, uh, payday loan lending is one of the worst lending activities that we've ever had in the United States. Uh, I have worked with uh, a number of groups, and I don't, by the way, I'm not on anybody's payroll today. I'm not uh, from any consumer advocacy group. Uh, I'm here for it, for myself and what I believe about the industry and what's good for the American citizen. Uh, what, what I would like to talk about is something that was a little bit different. We've, we've talked about uh, uh, compromise and talking to people, and we tried to do that in the state of Alabama down there. We had a, a law down there, it's called the Alabama Small Loan Act. We've got one called the Alabama Consumer Credit Act. Uh, they worked well since 1955 in the state. And then we had deferred lenders or payday lenders came into Alabama and circumvented the law down there. And uh, we've tried to get reform on it. We've tried to work with the state legislature. We've had bills for the last five years that's in down there. And we can't get a bill out of committee because of the lobbyists that comes in from the payday loan industry. I went and testified this year in the regular session of the legislature, and while I was standing up at the podium down there, I counted 32 lobbyists that were standing around the edges out there. I talked to one lobbyist that uh, was representing the industry down there, and I asked him, I said, how much did you make today? He said, $25,000. That's a lot of money that the consumer doesn't have. Uh, the, the CFPB is the first time in my life that I've ever seen a, a federal enforcement agency that did what it was supposed to do. And I applaud CIPD for what they're doing today. And I believe that we need to have a national regulation of the payday loan industry because you can't get it done through state legislatures. You can't get it done through state business. Thank you, Mr. Gowan. <laughs> Jessica Parker. Hello, my name is Jessica Parker. I've been in the payday advance industry for about three years now, um, and I get to help hundreds of people, um, and I, I enjoy doing it every day. Um, I'm here today for a customer um, who's not able to make it because she had to go into work today, um, but she wanted me to share her story. She is a single mother, um, has two kids, and because of some unforeseen circumstances, had to um, got into a situation where she couldn't pay her rent. She fell short on her rent. Um, and she came to us because everyone else told her no. And we were able to um, give her the money that she needed to provide shelter for her family. Um, and she was very thankful when I was able to tell her yes. She was in tears, um, just full of joy that she was finally able to get the money that she needed to keep shelter over her family. Um, and there are many stories that you could say, and a lot of people say, you know, they could get help from their families, from the bank. But no, they can't. What do you do when your family has no money and in the same situation that you're in, you need help? Um, and I'm, we're here to help them, and I enjoy doing it every day. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Parker. <laughs> Stacy Reese Snyder. <laughs> you got it. Again, thank you all for being here, but I do have to say I am troubled by the federal government's overreach again on trying to regulate human behavior. Uh, I'm concerned about a couple of things because these people, they sign over the ability for those people to get into their bank account. We are intelligent consumers, just like this gentleman said. We'll go a long way to find a good deal. And overreaching and trying to regulate how we behave because we get into trouble, or our families don't have the money to help us out, or we don't have a relationship with the church. It's not the government's business to regulate consumer behavior. That's all I have to Thank say. Thank you, Ms. Reese Snyder. <laughs> Teresa Burns. <laughs> Teresa Burns. Billy Bratcher. Gary McNabb. Thank you. 
First of all, thank you and the CFPB for being here today and also for this opportunity to speak. I am C CEO of a small payday loan lender in rural Tennessee. Our stores primarily are in towns of 10,000 and under people, a lot of them in 2,000 um, population towns. On the way here this morning, I called four bankers, four different banks, and I said, what's the minimum loan you'll make? I heard 1,000, 1,500, 2,000, and 5,000. And I said, why won't you do smaller loans? They said, we cannot make any money. Or we can't make any money on $5,000 loans, what one bank told me. I say that to you because I really think you need to understand that consumers need access to credit. Is the payday loan industry perfect? No way. No, nobody's perfect. One thing that's been said several times today is properly income qualifying people. We try our best to do that, and I'm the first one to tell you we just mess up. But, we, but as a result of that, we're able to loan money to new customers. And I defined a new customer as somebody who hadn't done business with us in six months. That, at the end, that in a year's time, 90% of those will pay off and we'll never see them again. That's what we're all about. And I would invite and welcome the opportunity to have more detailed discussion with the CFPB about my numbers, because I think they're different in rural America than what a lot of the numbers are. Thank you. Have a Thank good day. Thank you, Mr. McNabb. <laughs> Joe White. Hi, my name is Joe White, and I'm here today. I run a technology company in Nashville. We have over 200 employees throughout the state. I also sit on the board of the Bootstraps Foundation. Bootstraps Foundation takes children who have a 4.0 in high school but have absolutely no means to go to college. And the, uh, uh, they, they have lived through adversity, awful things that have happened to them, cancer, incest, murder, yet they have a 4.0 and they want to go to college and Bootstraps gets them there. And lastly, I'm on junior achievement. We actually teach financial literacy to fifth graders and high schoolers. And so all of these things tie in together. We have employees, and we have uh, these, these kids going to college to get literacy or, or, or learning, and then financial literacy with junior achievement. And um, I, too, am, come, uh, or, uh, am, am perplexed with, with the government overreach. I think it's awful. But at the same time, I think about things like motorcycle helmets and seat belts and, 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 and speed limits. And I'm thinking, boy, those are good government. I'm glad to be overreached in those areas. So I think there's a good spot for payday lending. And it might need some regulation. But there is a, there is a spot there that needs, uh, needs to be fulfilled. And I want to make a comment that um, the payday lending company in Nashville, Advanced Financial, they actually send one of our recipients each year to college and money they raise in the community to give back. And their CFO has recently approached us and says, can we help you at, at Junior Achievement with financial literacy? That just like uh, Dave Ramsey says that, you know, perhaps you, n never needing a loan is the best outcome. Uh, so we got some good people in this industry in the city and they're not all bad. And lastly, Paige, uh, uh, with uh, Vanderbilt Financial Literacy Education. Thank you for doing that and getting on this committee to make sure what you know, they know. Uh, Onisha, the consequences. You talked about them and they are dire, but sometimes the consequence of not getting that loan might even be more dire. And, and lastly, <laughs> Lynn talked about personal responsibility. And I couldn't help but think of the two examples in Director uh, uh, Cordroy's uh, speech. He gave two examples. The 81-year-old woman who borrowed some money to buy the cancer medicine for her daughter. We, that's an awful story. That's just awful. And hopefully Obamacare and all the craziness going on there will help that a little bit. <laughs> but any type of loan you have, if the, payer, if, the, if the wage earner is deceased, you're going to have trouble paying back that loan. And that's what happened. I don't think you can reg regulate around that. And lastly, Lisa, she lost her job and she went for a payday loan. Listen to that word, it's a payday loan. 
She lost her job and then went to get a payday loan. Lisa, you don't have any more paydays. Thank you, Mr. That wasn't White. smart. Thank you. Tanya Burroughs. Tanya Burroughs. Heath Cloud. Hello, my name is Heath Cloud. Uh, I've been in the payday lending business now for about 13 years. And it's been a very enjoyable time of my life because um, in the payday lending, we, uh, you, you see so many different stories that come through and you're able to help those folks in that time of need. And we also teach our people and our customers that what they need to borrow, n not to enforce more upon them than they can stand. But I enjoy doing what I do for a living. I love being able to help people in that time of need because you've heard it across the board here. You cannot go to a bank and get the needs uh, just for 200, 300, $400. I am so thankful to be able to help someone uh, in a time of need, a crisis or a small situation, and then see that smile, that relief up on their face uh, when they leave my office because I was able to help them. That's what makes my day, and that is why I enjoy doing what I do for a living. I've been doing it 13 years, and I'm planning on continuing to do it as long as the industry is in place and in intact. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cloud. <laughs> Tristina Sparks Gonzalez. Hello, my name is Tristina Sparks Gonzalez. I'm a representative for Advance America. Um, I've had the pleasure of working for this company for 10 years. I reside in Clarksville, Tennessee, where Fort Campbell is. Um, there are some things that I am very concerned about. Number one, nobody has touched on um, the statistics when it comes to the 36% annual percent rate that is being imposed in the military world that is now trying to be imposed in the civilian world. What this equates to and our industry is $1.18 on every $100 borrowed, which is not enough to cover overhead costs such as rent, water, lights, salary. Um, everybody speaking today has, has not touched on that. Um, I'm all for regulation. I'm all for um, imposing regulation to help con consumers, you know, um, have fair and transparent um, regulations so that they know what they're getting into and to make it a little bit more affordable to get out of. But what I'm not for is unfair, untransparent regulation um, that will be crippling to this industry. You should consider the fact that this is a multi-billion dollar industry. And if you cripple this industry, you're going to put possibly millions of people out of jobs, their affiliates, and the consumer won't have as many choices as they do now. I just want you to think about these things before you take this information to wherever it's going. And to all the state legislators that may be here, I want you to think about that too. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sparks Gonzalez. <laughs> Mitch Smith. Hi, I'm Mitchell Smith. I'm also with Advance America and been a payday lender for about 10 years. Uh, the one thing that amazes me that no one's talked about at all is the fact that you can uh, bounce a $5 check and wham, there you go, $35 on your bank account. <laughs> Who's the villain, really? I mean, uh, I can get you $200 for $35 and uh, you'll be set to go for the next two weeks. Uh, we may not be the best choice, but we are the only choice for so many people. So think about that. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Paul Turner. Uh, thank you. I'm Paul Turner. I'm a professor of psychology, and my interest in payday loans really comes from my community and uh, a faith-based orientation, and I appreciate the faith-based community 
being included in this conversation today. Um, and in Columbia, Tennessee, we have a proliferation of payday loan businesses. And we're seeing the effect of that in our community. And uh, we're seeing some of the uh, effects that that has on families and being caught up in a debt cycle. So one of the things we're doing at the Mur Murray Hills Church is that we're uh, providing a, a pilot program where we're going to be able to do some counseling and maybe debt reduction things for some families in our communities. And, and so this is the piece of it that we think we can work on uh, as a, within our church and as a part of the faith-based community. Uh, however, we also believe that greater protection is needed for consumers and appreciate the opportunity to be here today and to advocate for that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Kimberly Waters. My name's Kim and I've worked for a payday advance company for almost seven years now. Um, today, I've heard a bunch of, we trap people. Um, we don't look at the ability that they have to pay it back and that's not true. Um, ability, stability is, ten, is one of the main things that we look at at my company to make sure we're giving good loans. We're giving these people money that they can afford to pay back. Um, we don't trap them into taking into these loans. They're not stuck in them. It's their choice that where else are they going to go? They can't go to a bank and borrow it. Um, myself, I've used them before I worked for the company and I've used them while I've worked for the company. They come in good place when, you know, Christmas, Easter baskets, your, sho your kids outgrow shoes. Those are the things that you can't afford all the time. It's nice to be able to have somewhere to go. No judgment, not looking at my credit. Um, gives me $100, $200, and it's a lot cheaper than um, running my debit card through the bank and, you know, them charging me $36 and then $5 a day for it being overdrafted. Um, I absolutely love what I do, and I love being able to give back to my community. Thank you, Ms. Waters. <laughs> Blaine Dixon. Blaine Dixon. Jordan Maynard. Jordan Maynard. Yeah, that's me. Um, good afternoon. I'm Jordan Maynard, and I'm a proud Tennessean. Um, the panel's here today because they're concerned about the costs associated with uh, payday loans. Well, I'm here today because I'm concerned about the costs associated with CFPB. Um, I was actually reading an article the other day about how much the CFB, CFPB employees make, and, uh, and it's more than the average government employee. And some of the employees with this bureau were actually on the Obama campaign team in 2012. Um, I don't know, you know how you guys feel about that, but I know I can speak for a lot of Tennesseans and say that doesn't sit well with me. Um, you know, in addition, in addition, your spending is not subject to congressional oversight. And, uh, you know, if, if Congress is not overseeing where your spending is going and where your money is going, you know, how can we tell where there's waste? How can we tell where that money is going to? And so, you know, there's a lot of concerns with the cost with CFPB, and um, that's why I was here today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Maynard. Eric Quinnum. Eric Quinnum. Hi, my name's Eric, and um, I go to church right down the street here uh, in East Nashville, City Church of East Nashville. So I represent with a small group of people here, a faith community that doesn't see you all as villains and hears you loud and clear that there's a need for the lending. Um, my question is, I also attended Vanderbilt Divinity School, and um, why are there not more nonprofits doing this type of lending? Why are they not involved in this industry? And I guess to add to that, I mean, if this kind of lending is so uh, damaging to people, maybe there will be more nonprofit lending organizations cropping up to meet this need uh, to the people that need money to borrow. Without the, uh, you know, if you're a nonprofit, you're not going to have those kinds of uh, profit making uh, needs, and so therefore you're going to be able to meet this need without having those perverse incentives. Uh, of the industry. Thank you. Thank you. Alicia Patz. Uh, 
Alicia Patz. One thing I actually didn't hear either in this room, and maybe I'm just not listening very clearly, is the fact that we have an economy that's dropping. There's a lot of people without jobs, a lot of people in need were, say for instance, who gets paid monthly, and maybe they don't get paid every 30 days. Maybe they get paid every fourth Wednesday. Sometimes these events do occur, and people need some kind of avenue somewhere to go. Say for instance, they have you know, something they have to pay for, and they don't have good credit. They can't go to the bank, my mom just lost her job and I can't go to her to get the money. My church has too many people, they can't help me. These places are here and place to help. And yes, they disclose everything and you have options. You don't have to take it, but it is a good avenue to have. And there's lots of positive things like there's fundraisers, there's jobs, there's lots of donations. There's more positives I see in this than I have in the government coming through regulating things. So I want to say I want to applaud the people who are here for the times of need where we don't have banking institutions, where they don't disclose information, where you may go forward and you may say, hey, I want to put a stop payment on something. And the banker says, oh, by the way, you just signed off to pay $36 and now your account's in overdraft. You have to pay another $36. It's not disclose. They may tell you to read a fine print, but they don't disclose it. So I applaud the, the companies that are here for consumers to be able to go through without having good credit or not having a family member or maybe not even get paid every 30 days. I applaud to have this avenue here for people who need it. Thank you, Ms. Patz. Charles Hunter. Thank you. I must work for one of, the, one of the good guys in this industry. We've been in this business for 35 years. I've been a part of it for 15. <clears throat> My job is the, the uh, job of answering all the consumer complaints and uh, concerns that come in. It's a, it's a very forgiving job because if somebody comes in and says or calls in or writes in or sends a CFPB complaint or state complaint, it says, this is a hardship, then the path is real clear. We verify the claim, verify the, what the customer owes, ask the customer a simple question. I'm the guy that talks to the customer and says, okay, what would you like us to do? And I would say 98 or 99 percent of the people says, okay, I owe the money, I'd like to pay it back, but something's happened in my life and I cannot do it as I agreed to. And we always say, yes, you just tell us what you want to do. If you have a hardship, if you have a problem in your life now, if you want to stretch it out in four payments or eight payments, whatever it takes, uh, the understanding of that, knowing that you can't force somebody to pay something they can't. And the, the, the questions are easy and the answers are easy. And I think uh, there are more people in this industry that do that. Uh, I just happened to be sitting next to a guy that's in this business, and I heard him over say, the, the same conversation that I have every day. He talked to a customer while we were sitting here and said, well, ma'am, what can you pay? And there was a figure mentioned. He said, okay, well, we'll take that over the next four months and you'll pay off your debt. Uh, I think that's more common than you could possibly imagine in this industry. Certainly in our business, it's, a, it's one of our core values. We do it. Thank you, Mr. Hunter. <laughs> Blaine Dixon. Blaine Dixon, Richard Chambers. Good afternoon. I know we've all been here a long time. I'll try to be brief. I've been in the consumer finance industry, the banking industry, a consultant to the alternative credit industry in almost every one of its forms beginning in the mid-1960s. Um, I would offer the perspective today that I am not speaking on behalf of any specific client. There were a couple of points made that I wanted to speak to from my own research into the customer bases of my clients and specifically into the bankruptcy filings across my clients. First, the consumer of the payday product, the consumer of the title product, the consumer of credit card product to some extent, particularly the secured card, has nine to 12 life emergencies per year. 
So I think you need to keep that in mind, that many of the consumers are continually having a problem making ends meet, and these companies are doing a great job of solving that problem. One of the interesting things in my research is that many of the borrowers view this industry in particular as a venture capitalist for them, and they have no other source of capital. This idea of the debt trap and the cycle of debt is so ridiculous to me because the consumer has made a conscious choice that they are going to continually live beyond their means for various reasons. We could cite hundreds of reasons. And as a result, they find that that gap is filled by a venture capitalist at a venture capitalist return. I think the industry is doing a good job of, solving, of serving all of its customers, and I would urge the CFPB to carefully study bankruptcy. I find in my study of bankruptcy filings, only 11% of the borrowers are borrowing from payday institutions. The average unsecured debt is eight to $13,000. You don't get that under most state laws from a payday lender. You get that from a variety of lenders. Uh, so I think Thank that- Thank you, Mr. Chambers. Thank you. Janine Geeky. Hello. I'm a um, payday loan consumer and have been for probably 10 or 12 years. And um, I'd like to say it's always been extremely clear what the cost of borrowing that money is. Um, it can't be much simpler than you're going to borrow 200 and pay back 230. Um, I, am, I feel more abused by the banking industry who, if I overdraft my account by $1, will charge me $35. Um, I heard people talk about 400% interest. I, I'm pretty good with math, but I can't even tell you what that interest rate would be. Um, and nobody's talked about, you know, the family who can't pay the electric bill. Um, when the electric bill, to, it, when the electricity gets turned off, they're going to be charged $150 to turn it back on. Um, nobody's concerned about those fees. Um, and, and these are the kind of things that I've had a payday loan uh, um, work for me over the years. Um, I've always known that I could rewrite that loan at a lower amount each time to pay it off if I couldn't pay it all off in full. And I found the people that work at the payday loans to always be above and beyond to explain to me what I'm paying for for the service they're giving and what services they have available because it isn't a one size fits all and they do have more than one product depending on what the situation might be. Uh, for the consumer. So I think it would be a real disservice to the people who don't have access to a pocket full of credit cards or a banker they can call for a personal loan to try to limit this industry because those are the people who need this service the most. Um, credit cards take 17 years to pay off the average credit card. Nobody's complaining about their fee. Thank you, Ms. Geeky. Robert Geeky. I, uh, my name is Bob Geeky. I'm uh, uh, disabled and get a, a monthly check. And I've used the um, places for well, probably over 10 years um, for incidentals like if your water bill is higher than it should be or your dog breaks its leg or you blow out your tires in your car and the bank's not going to loan you two or $300. They're going to want $2,000 from you. Um, so uh, going to them is... Uh, is a is a quick fix um, if you can't pay it back you shouldn't borrow it um, I know sometimes it doesn't work out that way your intentions sometimes are are good it doesn't work out but um, I think it's a, a, a great thing that they've come out with to help you out of a tight jam and um, they work with you to um, to help you get through it and um, make it easier for your life thank you mr. geeky Clarissa Griggs. Uh, 
My name is Clarissa. Um, I've worked for a payday loan company about two years now, and I'm very proud to work for a payday loan company just because I'm proud to be able to help people. I know that myself, I've been in a jam before, before I started working for this company, and I was able to go and borrow money to get help. And just like everybody else has been saying, it's hard to go to a bank. If you, and you might not even necessarily need as much money as the bank is willing to lend. So it's easier to be able to go somewhere that, like she said, they don't judge you. You just go in. You, um, and like, like she said also, we do look at the ability to be able to pay it back. So I'm proud to be able to help people who, who don't need And also, like the lady in the front there said, we also do help with the community. It's not just to loan money out or to, we're, we're not predators, we're not looking to try to hurt anybody, we're not looking to try to make people's lives miserable, we're just trying to help. And we're also wanting to help in the community too, so I'm proud to be able to work for a company that does provide those services. Thank you, Ms. Griggs. <laughs> Russ King. I'm Russ King, I'm a minister at the Donaldson Church of Christ right down the road and uh, I met yesterday with a man I'm doing my retirement planning with and I'm glad that uh, my stocks increased a little bit over this past year. I drive a 15 year old car, it's paid for. I've got a house that I have a mortgage on, be paid off in about three or four years. I've got a big screen TV. I majored uh, in Bible but I minored in business. The business of business is business and to make money. And I appreciate free enterprise and free market. There's no other country in which I'd rather live. And I want to say thanks to the CFPB being with us and the high level of discussion from both sides. Uh, I think you state your cases very well. Uh, I am concerned about the exorbitant rate of interest. That's a concern to me. Uh, our church last year, just one church in town, helped over 2,000 families, 2,000 families with food and clothing. We also, like the Maury Hills uh, gentleman mentioned, are trying to be proactive in helping educate people financially. We helped one family uh, who had uh, need of a short-term loan, and you certainly do meet needs that some of the banks don't. A bank's not going to loan you 500 bucks. And uh, according to CNN Money Today, this is off today's, payday loans are typically for 500 or less. But, but the fees that are carried are a concern. So one particular family helped, uh, we were able to reduce their loan uh, from a payday loan on their title loan on their car and save them $250. So I think education is important. Can we conduct business and protect people. Can we make money without being exorbitant and doing it on the backs of people and holding them down? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. King. That concludes the audience participation portion of today's field hearing. I want to thank you for taking the opportunity to tell us what you're seeing in your communities and thank you for the opportunity to listen to you. Cheryl, you have the floor. Thank you, Zixta, and thank you all for being with us today for the public portion of today's field hearing. Thank you for taking the time to join the CFPB, and thank you to all who watched us via live stream at consumerfinance.gov. This concludes today's field hearing at the Country Music Hall of Fame in Nashville, Tennessee. Have a great afternoon.